thank you very much for that questions. They are indeed big questions, some of the big questions in linguistics. And of course, I only gave partial answers in the talk. But one thing perhaps that I want to highlight using data-driven methods in combination with uh, some more microanalytic methods, what we can see is so sometimes some of the things we think are happening are actually not happening. So for example, uh, some research is about uh, things like lexical substitution. So there's a new word and it substitutes for an old word and the old word vanishes. But that's actually not true because words always keep company. Yeah? All words don't come in isolation, they come in certain clusters, which you can see, for example, when you look at word embeddings, word embedding models of words. So it's usually whole clusters of words that, that change. So they expand, for example, the vocabulary or they reduce the vocabulary, but substitution is actually fairly rare. Yeah? So that's one thing that we can see, and we can see this only when we um, use these data-driven methods. So that's one thing. And then uh, regarding um, the why of change, that's of course a very big question. And I actually I haven't addressed it in the keynote. Um, I looked at some of the effects of change, and then you can uh, infer something about uh, the causes of change, possibly. Now, why change occurs? Well, the world changes, so language changes. Language reacts to changes in the world and adapts to new you know, purposes of communication, new domains of discourse that come up. Um, that's a trivial answer. But what are the effects? Well, I think there is maybe some limit on this variation that we can see that has to do with the function of language to uh, be good for communication. So it puts limits on the variation because it needs to stay communicative. Yeah, the system needs to still fulfill the purpose of communication. And we can see some of these effects there as well. for this, um, this metaphor, because it, it actually fits what I'm trying to do or what we're trying to do quite well. Now, when you think of the telescope and the micros microscope, you, you have to think, okay, what functions do they fulfill? What, what do they allow me as instruments to see that I can't see without them? Yeah? And with a telescope, yeah, as, you, as we all know, you can look to far away places and get some idea, you know, about the shape, I don't know, the shape of a planet or something, or of a star. Or you can discover a star, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and with the microscope, um, you can draw something very close, and you can look at the details, the structure of something. And that's exactly that, that idea, that you need both. So if you have a humanistic object of study, like language or text, or it could also be spoken language, speech, yeah, you want to, to, to see both. So you need a telescope to look at the larger structures, the aggregated data, um, and to see patterns in those larger pet in those larger structures. And you need the microscope to go into the detail uh, to look at one particular word, to look at the environment of a particular word or a particular cluster of words, for that matter, to explore their properties. So I think. Um, while the, the microanalysis is very much ingrained in humanities disciplines like literary studies, cultural studies, history, and so on, um, the macroanalysis opens up this other perspective yeah, for, the human, for humanistic study, as is enabled with a telescope. You know, the mission of Clarion is to provide um, a research data infrastructure, which with the components we now have, we have resources, we have corpora that live in repositories in various Clarence centers. And um, we make sure in Clarence that these uh, resources are available to people, that other people can use them. And that's a great thing. Uh, we also help people build resources. That's very important. So we help them with the processes of building resources that conform to certain standards of representation in the field. The next step will be to uh, provide assistance in how to analyze these resources. We can spend lots of years to build a particular corpus and then 
it's just sitting there. That's not the purpose, right? That's good. But people want to use it. They want to do analysis. And I think at that end, we could still do um, a few more things uh, for the community. Like, for example, using computational language models as they are used in computational linguistics to do particular NLP tasks like, I don't know, part of speech tagging and entity recognition, what have you. And to take those models and apply them uh, to um, analysis, analysis of language variation, analysis of language change, whatever those questions are that a particular humanist is concerned with, and open up those models, make, make them transparent, make them explainable, uh, very much you know, uh, in, in the trend of uh, the new AI, uh, looking for explainability of systems and what systems actually do. Humans want to know what the systems do. They want to be able to trust the system. So we have to explain what the system does. And there I see a big role for the computational linguists and the computer scientists who are involved in NLP to um, open up these models and explain what they're actually doing so that users can trust them.